you guys. We're, uh, we're starting on time here. First of all, welcome. Thank you for coming to our corrosion workshop. Uh, my name is Tony. I'm the branch manager here at Western Specialty Contractors as well as an APT board member. Um, we have some speakers in town that travel a long way. So first we have Tim Gillespie. He's with Sika. He's one of their VPs. He's in from New York. Um, he's going to cover a lot of the uh, spa repair and how it relates to corrosion issues. Uh, secondly, we have Graham Jones, who's in town from London, England. You cross the pond Manchester. Us. Yep. Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Manchester. It's all the same. Yeah. <laughs> and Graham is with uh, CPRO. It's a company that manufactures and uh, designs cathodic protection systems for buildings. So definitely an expert in the field. Uh, we're gonna first half of the day. We're gonna spend just listening to their presentation. We're gonna break for lunch, which is out in the warehouse. And the second half, you're actually gonna get to experience a hands-on piece. Uh, for what these guys are talking about, you'll get to play with uh, spall repair as well as witness a cathodic protection insulation system and get your hands dirty. So kind of a unique presentation here. Um, at Western, safety is always first and foremost. So I'm going to turn over to our superintendent, John Carden, who's just going to give us a brief safety introduction to the building, the exits, and so on. So with that, John, take it away. Me? That's you. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Uh, just to just to cover a, a, a couple uh, safety items, emergency exits. Obviously, we've got uh, one here, but we've also got a large roll-up door. If we should have to evacuate, uh, you can use either of those. But we'd ask that you all collect at the western banner for a head count. We've taken a head count. We want to make sure everybody gets out safely. Hopefully, that doesn't happen. But uh, should should we have some sort of emergency that requires, uh, please collect at the western banner in the front. Uh, when we go out to do the hands-on, there's a few uh, uh, safety issues. Um, we've got an eye wash station and a first aid kit, uh, kit set up there. Uh, we've obviously got the uh, safety data sheets for all the products that we're going to use available for your review. Um, we will need some PPE. Um, there's different gloves. Once we go out there and ask that everybody wear our safety glasses, we'll provide them. We'll help you in selecting the gloves based on uh, what task you're performing. Um, there's uh, fire extinguishers and spill kits. Uh, I've got a craftsman out there that is trained on uh, spill collection. Uh, I'm also trained, so uh, we don't ask you or expect you to collect anything. If we do have a spill, we don't anticipate that happening. If you could just notify, uh, and I'll identify the gentleman. His name is Eddie, and, and we'll make sure everybody knows who he is. Just let us know there's a spill, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take care of it. Uh, Tyco is going to uh, take responsibility if we should have a medical emergency. Uh, she is going to meet the first responders out on the street. Um, Eddie, the foreman, is CPR certified. Uh, he'll administer any first aid necessary. Again, let's hope that we don't have to use this, but uh, let's not fail to plan. <coughs> um, we have a, a, a hazard assessment. Uh, OSHA says that this is uh, considered a construction site. Uh, with that being said, we get a site-specific safety plan, and we've just identified a few a few hazards. Um, one of them would be uh, mixing mortar that exposes us to silica dust. So we're going to ask that you don't actually mix the dry powders. Uh, we've got two gentlemen who are certified to wear respirators. We'll mix the dry powders, and the exposure is eliminated once it becomes a wet material. So at that point, you know, as long as you have your safety glasses and your gloves on, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, we're going to be working around a little bit of a, a rebar. It has it has wire ties. Uh, there's a potential to get poked. We'll make sure you're wearing the, the proper gloves, but it's good to talk about so everybody's aware of it. Uh, let's see, working with electricity. Um, for the most part, you probably won't be working directly with electricity. Uh, however, there is electricity out there. We're all on GFCIs, which is intended to protect us from a, a shock. Um, again, you know, I, I prefer that we just let our craftsmen take care of that, but we, we encourage you to, to take part in the application of the mortars and different things like that. But it's probably easiest if we do the mixing and we take care of the... Uh, the, the items like that. Any any safety related questions? Bathrooms, which I asked Tony why why is that safety? He said <laughs> we could have an accident. Safety first. <laughs> uh, so there's there's two bathrooms just just down this hallway. Uh, one's identified as a, a men's and women's, and there's also a bathroom in the warehouse. Any questions? How'd I do? 
Good, good. Right. Well, I, feel very, I feel very safe. <laughs> Thanks for your time, guys. Okay. All right, well, thank you. It's, uh, it's really it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I get a little more background about myself. I'm uh, Vice President. I'm responsible for, uh, for product management uh, within SICA as it relates to an area that we call refurbishment, which is basically repair and protection of, uh, of reinforced concrete. Um, so that's really what our focus is. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity, I was out here in October, and I uh, came and had met with uh, Tony, and he had indicated to me uh, about the organization's interest of doing a seminar really on concrete repair. And as we got talking about it, uh, we, we thought that that was a great idea, and we sort of expanded the subject a little bit to include not just concrete repair and protection, but also this concept of cathodic protection, which um, at times I'm going to refer to it as kind of new, but in actuality, I think, Graham, I think some of your older jobs are 20 years old. Yeah. Um, but having said that, like any technology, there's, there's advancements that take place. And uh, so we're really excited to bring really the combination of both the concrete repair, which I'll cover, which is kind of our traditional approach to how we, how we fix concrete. And then Graham will cover the cathodic protection, specifically as it really relates to these steel frame buildings um, and these masonry facades. Um, so with that, um, I'll get started with, uh, with mine. The, both the presentations are filed with, uh, with AIA. So for my portion, there's, uh, there's two credits. So there's an hour of the presentation, and then there's an hour of the hands-on. And then with, uh, with Graham's, there's actually four. Um, so just want to make sure if you do need your credits uh, to make sure that I, we do have some sign-in sheets there and I just need your, uh, your RA numbers um, so that we can do the filing for that and get you the certificates as well. And we're, we're happy to take care of that. So the things that I'll cover in mine will entail some of the common problems that we see, uh, some of the investigation techniques that are utilized, repair and protection approach, uh, and then I have a case study, and if, if time permits, I actually have a second case study. And then uh, later this afternoon, we'll do the, uh, the hands-on. Uh, a little bit of background about our, our industry. We have a, a document. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in, in an organization called ICRI, which is the International Concrete Repair Institute. And that organization gathered a group of, uh, of industry members, and we've developed this, what's called the Vision 2020. And just a couple of interesting... Um, facts and figures from that, uh, you know, from that document is, you know, we estimate that, uh, that the industry spends about $20 billion a year repairing and protecting and strengthening uh, reinforced concrete structures. And the reasons for the deterioration have to do with either chlorides or carbonation, there's free stall damage, poor cover, oftentimes there's a combination of these as well, it's not just one of these that's, uh, that's the problem on a given project. Um, but also, you know, causes from damage such as fire and earthquake. And then there's also reasons for fixing concrete is because of maybe defects. Um, incredibly, one of the areas that we actually do a lot of concrete repair work is in Vegas. And it was a lot of that work is actually fixing new construction defects. Um, so really the need to fix concrete can arise from a lot of different reasons and, uh, and causes. On the right, which is one of the challenges to our industry, is uh, <clears throat> the, the Army Corps of Engineers is one of the largest owners of concrete structures in, uh, in the country. And they've done a study on the performance of repairs on their structures. And they estimate that about half of those structures, those repairs, are actually performing well. Um, and then the other half are either fair, poor, or they've, they've <coughs> failed. And this is within five, to five or ten years. Um, and so they're, really their assessment is that we're, we're fixing concrete, but we're not necessarily doing it for the long term. And you know, we, have, we have an approach to it, and the technology exists in order to get long-lasting repairs. In our company, we've been very proud of the fact that we've earned a lot of awards within ICRI for a category called longevity, where the repairs were done, and 10 years later we go back and we do an assessment and determine how well the repairs are performing. And we're very proud that we've won a number of those awards. But all of those jobs have very similar characteristics, you know, where they hired good consultants who did an investigation, determined the root cause, designed a fix, performed a mock-up, hired a good contractor, used good materials, performed inspection during installation. 
you know, all those steps were taken. And so we know that the ability exists to have long-lasting repairs. It's really a matter of implementing it, though. So some of the common problems as it relates to uh, these, these historic type buildings, and it was kind of interesting and, and fun for me. I actually had to create this presentation for this purpose. It's not <coughs> something that I could just take off the shelf. Um, and in doing so, I was able to work uh, really with uh, my colleague, uh, Brad Kamen, who you'll, you'll meet a little more closely, I think, at lunch um, in this afternoon. Brad's been with SICA for 20 years, like myself, um, spends all his time in the Bay Area here. And really, most of these examples are from projects in the Bay Area. So you may, you may recognize them. If I get the name wrong, you know, Tony, John, Brad, just correct me. I think I remember which these, what these projects are. But, uh, uh, but anyway, so some of the common problems that we see when it comes to uh, these types of buildings, <clears throat> I've really broken it into two categories. We have facade failure. And the first category there deals with spalling reinforced concrete. And you could see that either, you know, the facade itself or around windows, at lintels, corners, parapets. Um, and then there's also spalls that occur within the masonry, where the masonry itself is failing. Um, and the reason for that is, is for steel corrosion. And that could be occurring at spandrel beams and columns, parapets as well, uh, and lintels. And I don't want to forget, you know, there's a host of other issues that we're dealing with uh, that's really beyond the scope of what we're going to cover today. But a lot of times when we're doing these repair projects, we're also dealing with leaks. And those leaks could be the result of either cracks that are in the concrete, joints that have failed either around the windows or other penetrations, or we could have failed protection either at the roofing or waterproofing, within the roofing or waterproofing. So I want to just acknowledge, you know, these are all common problems that we see on these types of buildings, but we're not going to cover that today. So really the focus of today are really these two, these first two uh, bullet points. So it's really addressing spalling of concrete, and that is what I'm going to really focus on. And then the second topic deals with the corrosion of or masonry failures, uh, primarily due to structural steel corrosion, and that's what Graham is really going to focus on. So his will, his will be closer to maybe a two-hour, hour and a half, two hours. I'll spend about an hour. <clears throat> so some of the common problems that we see uh, this, these photos here, this is from, uh, from Western, this is uh, 222 Sutter. I have a case study that I'll, I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But uh, this is just examples of, I think this is actually during some of the prep work, but some of the areas where loose or damaged or deficient concrete was identified, which could pose, you know, does pose that health and safety risk, you know, if that does, if we don't catch that in time. Um, and I, I understand, I think, that San Francisco is actually in the process maybe instituting some type of uh, facade maintenance um, uh, ordinances, which, of course, New York, which is where I'm from, you know, they, they initiated that, I believe it was like in 1980, 1979. Unfortunately, as the result of a student at Columbia uh, who was killed <coughs> in a falling piece of masonry. And I guess that is unfortunate, and Graham, you'll touch on some of that too. Yeah. It's the reasons for a lot of these ordinances. Unfortunately, it's the result of a fatality. Um, but hopefully some of the things we'll learn today um, will begin to show maybe the specifying and the owner communities that you know to intervene proactively doesn't necessarily have to be a costly endeavor. And I think sometimes that's been the obstacle in terms of trying to deal with these, these challenges. It's just been the reluctance to spend the money. So a closer look, this is 222 Sutter again. And, and this is really more during some of the concrete repair but you can see over here in the green and the, and the red areas that have been identified where you know, they can see some rusted rebar or they've identified some concrete that looks deficient and those are areas that are ultimately going to get repaired. So again, more examples of a facade. This is 1101 Green Street. Um, and you can see in here just this is the, the coating has been removed and you see all these areas of cracking, see areas where spalls have been fixed throughout that facade. So again, this is, I think, believe it's a 20-story building right there at the top of, uh, of Russian Hill. Um, had the opportunity actually yesterday to go by this job. And this was completed, uh, I believe, eight years ago. And looks looks fantastic. 
Pier 70, I believe. So again, more facade failures <coughs> right here. And a further back view where these are failures of concrete at the facade, beams, columns. So a lot of areas where rusted steel pushing out onto the concrete, causing spall and causing cracking and ultimately spalling. We'll see a lot of times damage around windows. You know, it's areas where water can infiltrate into that area. With it, could possibly bring chlorides, or it makes it a very damp environment, causes the steel to corrode. Another example, this is from 1101 Green Street, where spalling is occurring here. What you actually see, this is in the process of repair, but these are areas, I'll touch on this in a little bit later, but these are galvanic anodes that were installed on that project to protect the steel from corrosion. So that's this is actually uh, during the, this is during the repair process. This area hasn't been prepared yet, uh, but that's more of an existing swall around window. This is a naval yard in, in Philly that was converted to an out, uh, I think an urban outfitters, uh, but it was a historic building. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, corrosion here at the sill, causing cracking in the concrete. More corrosion here. This is Point Arena Lighthouse. So again, some uh, steel embedded within the concrete. And I'm gonna to touch on, on this in a moment as to you know, kind of take a step back from all this as to why this is happening, because uh, that's an important thing to understand when you begin to think about how you then address it. Uh, this is out at Alcatraz. And this is actually a spall, I believe within a spall. I think this, this, had been, this column had been fixed, um, but the actual repair didn't really perform very well. Again, in columns. So these tend to be, you know, you're dealing with these sections around windows, columns. Um, one of the culprits of that is because you have you have lack of cover. There's not enough cover to protect the steel, and uh, and I'll get into that in a in a moment here. But just more examples of, you know, we commonly see this. You know, these areas have actually been a little bit prepped, and you can tell that because of, you know, the saw cut that's been taking place around the perimeter. But again, those areas were identified as loose concrete and now they're beginning to excavate out the concrete, expose the steel in order to uh, implement the repair. So here's an example, I believe, Brad, this was Divisadero School? Divisadero School? Divisadero. Right? Pronouncing that correctly? So here, actually, this is structural steel, masonry, and Graham will actually get more into this. But this was a concrete repair job for us. And you can see here, we're beginning to dowel in some rebars and basically we're gonna cast concrete back around that, uh, around that column. <clears throat> Same project, here the steel has actually been cleaned at this point and it's ready to receive uh, what we call a, a rebar coating, uh, which we'll, we'll show you that uh, later this afternoon. But it's a, a method of, of providing additional protection to the steel. This is actually uh, Lake Merritt Boathouse. So this is one of the beams supporting that, uh, that structure. And you can see the shape, the, the condition of some of the beams where you can see where the rebar was at one point and it's been rusted so bad that it's completely spalled and, and the rebar has now, uh, in this case, actually come out. As part of this project, we actually did concrete repair and then we did structural strengthening, which again is a, a topic beyond what we'll talk about today. but. These materials and methods, they, they do exist and allow us to repair and, in this case, preserve these, uh, these, these buildings. This is out at Alcatraz. So here's a soffit. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, the, uh, the, the safety risk that, that, that this poses if you're walking underneath these things and the concrete is loose and you happen to be walking underneath that at the time when you know, the concrete lets go. Um, certainly under this soffit uh, condition here. A lot of very uh, corroded rebar. Again, Point Arena. This is one of the, uh, I guess we'll call it the, the cornices at that, but areas that have been identified where there's uh, delaminations occurring, hollows in the concrete. And this is that area where it's been now beginning to, to be removed and prepared. And just look at the condition of the steel. How much of that uh, section <coughs> has occurred within the steel itself. <clears throat> so this is an area where this is actually still the uh, the lighthouse, not necessarily a balcony, but in these areas here, and we'll we'll show you some of that when we 
uh, do some of the demonstrations. We have some anodes, uh, galvanic anodes installed at these areas, and they've been encapsulated in a mortar uh, to allow better functionality of those anodes to perform. But basically, they're, they're in that repair to protect the steel, um, to protect the steel not just in here, but also adjacent to those repairs. Because sometimes what will happen when you do a repair is you'll actually, you'll actually accelerate some corrosion just outside of the repair. And I have an example of that here in a moment. Uh, but again, another example of a balcony. And, and part of the problem or challenge is when we're with these kinds of elements is getting the steel in the right location and getting the proper cover. Because uh, really, you know, concrete is an excellent form of protection for the steel. I mean, we know structurally that they perform uh, you know, in a manner where concrete is very good in compression, steel is very good in tension. Together they work as a, you know, as a unit uh, structurally. But from an electrochemical standpoint, uh, they also are very complementary. The concrete will protect the steel. So the best way to protect the steel is to have good quality concrete and have lots of cover. But unfortunately, the reality is a lot of jobs we're dealing with in Western is because we're out there because of insufficient cover. And that's just what, you know, that, that's the condition that we're dealing with. And a lot of times it was like the walls were too thin. They never could have even had sufficient cover. Yeah, I'm yeah, not, it's not sure. the bars too far one side or the other. Yeah, it's just exactly. bad design per and, what we know now. And new codes are now dictate how much cover is required. And uh, so these things weren't necessarily understood yeah. years and years ago when these when these buildings were were constructed. We knew that concrete and steel work very well from a structural standpoint, but from that whole electrochemical standpoint, I don't believe that understanding really was there. Uh, and it really wasn't. You know, it wasn't until 2000 at ICRI we created a corrosion committee. Uh, and, and the organization was founded in 1988, 12 years earlier. And one of the main reasons the organization exists is because of corrosion of steel and concrete. But it took us 12 years to actually form a committee to deal with that. And here you could see, in this case, an owner tried to buy a little bit of life by just kind of spray painting a little bit of paint on the rebar in hopes that maybe that would slow the corrosion down. Um, but in reality, it just it really didn't provide any protection to the steel. And, uh, you know, just touching on, you know, this is a, a <coughs> coating removal that was taking place at 1101 Green Street. Um, and due to, I call it a failed coating, but they had other issues there, which, which I'll, I'll touch on as well. And then really, <coughs> Graham will spend really his time, but I, I had some photos and I thought I would put them in here just to kind of whet your appetite as to what you'll see with, with Graham's presentation. But, you know, this is a photo now where we're dealing with structural steel. This is a spandrel beam that's corroding. And you can see here, they're determining how far out is this wall relative to the, uh, to the rest of the wall in the spandrel beam. And it's about three and a half inches of differential movement. So you know that, uh, you know, inevitably this is, this is going to be a problem and a potential area and zone for failure. Here's an area that's been prepped where the brick has been removed, the spandrel beam's been exposed. And I guess this has been sort of the traditional approach, right? Kind of remove the masonry, clean up the steel, uh, and then reinstitute the masonry in, in hopes of trying to match that as best as, uh, as possible. And, uh, you know, it was interesting. Graham was actually, uh, we were together in New York in, uh, in October. And, and just out of curiosity, I challenged Graham, like, you know, how widespread is this problem? in New York. And uh, I said, why don't you, you know, you were staying in the city, and I said, why don't you go walk the city, you know, when you have some free time? Well, we actually were at an appointment in Newark later that afternoon. We got out of the parking lot, and around us were three buildings that were showing these kinds of problems. I mean, that's just how widespread it was. And uh, so I didn't have to really convince myself anymore just, just how widespread the problem is. And I didn't need to walk. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a win-win. I just actually. got the car and went like that. <laughs> I got the information I was looking for, and Graham didn't have to walk a few miles in, uh, in hopes of trying to find it. Uh, but it, but what was what really struck me though was when they do the replacement of the masonry. How often there seems to be either little consideration to actually trying to replace it with something that was even close to what they took out. And I know a lot of times that may be very difficult to do, but 
Uh, but it, it was clear. I mean, the brick was sort of a, a you know, a, a, a kind of a, almost a blackish, uh, reddish brick. And what they put in there was like a tan brick. Um, so it was really almost like no consideration given to trying and the to... The mortar's totally bright versus the <clears throat> old stuff's got a tint to it. Yeah. 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 So uh, it, it just struck me mm. as, as that. And that may be a deterrent of why people don't necessarily want to do strip and replace. It's just the, the challenges with finding similar or like, like materials. Uh, this is... Uh, I'm not sure if this is still the, the Visadero High School brand. Is that... Uh, but this was concrete repair. Now, this is a spandrel beam. This has actually been grinded and prepped to remove all of the rust. And it's just about ready to, now to receive a replacement of concrete. And then we'll see this quite a bit, where you see uh, you know, the corners of a building, and you see cracking going right up the corner, and you know, the brick is moving as a result of the steel corroding. This is actually a job that we did. This is 90 Church Street in uh, Manhattan, right across the street from uh, uh, the uh, Freedom Tower. And uh, we did this in uh, 2008. Uh, interesting project. Uh, Thornton Thomas said he was the engineer on this job. And they knew that the limestone uh, facade was moving. They had been monitoring that. And uh, this was a job we did with Western. Um, they considered the option of remove and replace, but elected in this case to actually go with cathodic protection. And, uh, and really the area that we did, it was from the seventh floor setback up to the 15th floor, and it was two columns, um, two corners that they opted to do, and I believe there were six corners um, based upon the, the floor plan the layout of, uh, of the building. And they identified two, actually when we did the mock-up, they decided this one really wasn't a concern, but this one was more of a concern. And so they, they switched the, the, uh, the columns that they were going to do the protection on, which was no problem. Uh, you know, you had given them a proposal in Western for a certain linear footage, and it was up to them, you know, which columns did you want to apply that to. So really just some nasty corrosion here at a lintel. This is a parapet, um, and an interesting story behind this one I got this from Masonry Preservation Services. They're a company uh, in the Baltimore, Pennsylvania area. And uh, for years, the owner on this job had asked them to come and do some caulking because they had leaks uh, in the top, you know, the, the, the offices on the, on the top floor. Would you come, do some waterproofing, do some caulking for us, you know, address the problem. And they, and they knew what, you know, it was more of a waterproofing issue. And they said, no, they must have turned them down three or four times. Finally, they convinced the owner that, look, we need, to, we need to pull out an area and take a look and see what the issues are. Because you have more of an issue, more of a problem than just waterproofing. So they began to dismantle some of the, the parapet here. And they had to just keep going because the condition of the steel they saw was just so heavily corroded. And actually, in one area, the steel was so corroded, it had corroded through the connection and the only reason the beam didn't actually collapse and fall was because the columns weren't plumb. And when the beam became dislodged, it actually got wedged between the columns. Where was this? And uh, this was, um, you know, it would have been like in the Baltimore, uh, Baltimore area. Uh, that's where this contractor now does his work. But, um, but the, you know, it, just a, an amazing story. And uh, I know that the guy, Jeff Erdley, who, um, you know, is, is the owner of this company. He was involved with, I think, the development of the ASTM for facade uh, inspection. Uh, but just, I give him a lot of credit for, you know, not just doing what the owner was asking him to do, which was go and just re -caulk, fix my waterproofing, stop the leak, because he knew that that was not the root cause of what the real problem was. This one, you know, up until yesterday, I had no idea what this was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sitting with Tony and John, but I guess this is looking down on a column, and you've got a beam and a connection here. But you can just see how how bad the rust is, um, you know. And you know, how do you how do you get into something like that and actually fix it? Uh, and I'm going to deal again more with the concrete side. Graham will deal with the the, the masonry and the steel structural steel corrosion side. Um, and there's solutions for this. So that's that's the good news. Um, in terms of determining root cause, 
some of the common uh, things that we do, I won't go into this in detail, but in general, what an engineer will do is he'll go out, he'll, he'll maybe do a survey, look at things visually, take a look at drawings, hopefully there's some asphalts, get a good understanding of, of the building, go out there, then they'll start doing some cover surveys. Um, they'll do some half cell potentials, they'll do some corrosion rate, you know, just to get an idea of what is the general health of the building, how's it doing, where are their problems, how widespread are those problems, and can we identify that to a particular reason and a root cause. Uh, they may pull out a core, like they did here and do a petrographic analysis to have an understanding. Um, in this particular example here, this was pulled from a, a building in Boston that was built in the 70s and they used chlorides in the mix because of concrete that was being placed in the wintertime. So they had cast in place concrete with, with chlorides. So they had already cast chlorides into the concrete. So from day one, that, that building was on a path toward corrosion. Uh, they'll check for carbonation which you may, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. This is a test that was done to test for the uh, pH or the carbonation of the, uh, of the concrete. They'll look for the chloride contents. So pulling all these things together, you know, the engineer consultant can get a kind of an overall, you know, it's like going for the physical and getting a number of different things done, whether it's an EKG or, or blood work or stress test or blood pressure, you know, all of these different things to gauge the general health of the building and then really begin to come up with a, with a strategy now, you know, identify the root cause, and then come up with a strategy on how you deal with the root cause. So for chloride content, still common ASTM test, they'll drill a few holes, they'll pull out the powder, and then they'll test it for chlorides. And they'll often test it at different depths. And so the idea is if, you know, if I've got good cover and my rebar is down here, more likely my chloride levels are going to be lower at that point. If my rebar is up here, it's going to be in a higher chloride condition because it's going to take less time to get to the steel because it's closer to the surface. And then the other test, a lot of times we'll see in concrete, they'll, they'll very simple test, they'll take a solution of uh, phenothaline and if you apply that to some concrete that's been broken and you do that you know, relatively soon, um, when you spray this solution onto the concrete, if you get a purple reaction, that tells you that the pH is high, which means that that steel is in a good environment. If it remains clear, like it does here, then the pH is low. And if the pH is low, then the steel is now in an environment that's a, that's a more aggressive environment. So these are, I call them accelerators. They don't necessarily cause corrosion, but they are accelerators. They, they are contributing reasons as to why uh, ultimately we're going to have corrosion. Whether it's inadequate cover, or it's poor quality cover, previous concrete repairs, patches that aren't performing, um, could be failed sealants, clogged drains, ponding of water, you know, all of these things, you know, really what they do is they lead to a condition that can cause the steel to corrode faster than it would have if these conditions were being addressed. So inadequate cover, you know, you can see in this example here where the steel is literally at the, at the face. And on this job they had a lot of problems with cover, more in these, these architectural features. And again, to your point, you know, the, the, the elements were designed, they were so thin, it was <laughs> difficult to get the steel in a position where it was going to have good cover on both sides. You know, another accelerator that we discovered is you ever had a bad aggregate pyrites in your aggregate, which yeah. sort of pops stuff off too. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we get uh, we alkali silica reaction, and uh, you know, aggregates could be another source of uh, you know causing the spalling, which then leads to steel being exposed and ingress of other aggressive yeah. chemicals. So yeah, it's it's really important to understand what the root cause is uh, before you devise the fix. You know, here's an example I referred to it earlier, but this was an area that had been repaired, and we call this uh, you know, the ring halo effect, or the incipient anode. Um, and what happens is when I've placed this mortar concrete around the steel, 
this reinforcing steel is actually in two different environments now. It's in a, possibly a chloride contaminated environment, and then it's in a fresh concrete environment. And the difference in those environments will actually cause a corrosion cell. And it will cause the steel that's adjacent to that patch to accelerate in corrosion, which then can lead to a spall. So here, I mean, the contractor did everything right. They, they sounded the area out, they excavated where the problem was, they put the repair in, but you know, there's nothing to really address outside the patch, you know, which is, you know, it's, kind of, it's a constant struggle in our business, you know, because a lot of times the owner doesn't really want to spend the money to do the repair until they realize that they really have no choice, you know, because now I've got areas that are unsafe, unsightly, uh, but then we want them to do the extra mile to not just repair it, but also consider protecting it or monitoring it and doing some other things on a more proactive basis. Failed joints, failed sealants, we see this very common, whether it's around windows or other kinds of penetrations. Again, it's, a, it's an easy source of ingress of moisture. And really, that's what we're trying to do is keep moisture out. So really, what a lot of this leads to, whether it's concrete or masonry, is because of the steel corroding. And that's corroding one of the two leading, or the two leading accelerators of that are chlorides and uh, carbonation. So I, I made mention of this earlier, but just to take a step back, you know, kind of we've seen examples of some problems, and uh, we've been sort of covering um, some of the issues that were, were challenged within the industry. But if we take the step back, when we first place concrete and it's around the reinforcing steel, this passive layer will form. And this is in concrete that's got a high pH. So this passive layer, I mean, anybody have an idea how, take a guess how thick that is? I mean, if you, if you took a human hair and you divided it 10,000 times, that's the thickness of that passive film. And it's that passive film that's really protecting the steel from corroding. And once the film is destroyed and, and you're in the presence of oxygen and moisture, that steel can then corrode. So as I mentioned, if we have good cover and lots of it, that film will remain intact and the steel will not corrode. But over time, what happens, basically all you need for corrosion, basically four things. Uh, I've, I've mentioned a lot about chlorizing and carbonation, but that's not, you don't necessarily need those. Those are more accelerators. You need what we call an anode and a cathode. Think of it almost like a battery, right? You need an electrolyte, which in our case is gonna be concrete. You know, in our industry, we refer to concrete as a hard sponge, right? And it's always partially saturated. It's never 100% dry. Unless it's submerged, it's not 100% uh, moisture. It's always somewhere in between. And as long as it's somewhere in between, you have a good electrolyte that will support corrosion. So if I have oxygen and, and moisture, which I do in a partially saturated concrete, those four parameters, those four things exist, so I can now have corrosion. So, in my civil engineering layman terms, Graham will complicate this far more in a little bit, or hopefully shed some light on it in a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> uh, so, in, in my simple civil engineering terms, uh, the, the anode will give off electrons, and in, in the process of doing that, the iron goes from iron to Fe plus 2. So, iron ions are, are, are given off. There's a reduction at the cathode of oxygen and moisture that causes the creation of these hydroxyl ions. And initially, if you had some understanding of that, you'd think that's good because hydroxyl ions could maybe raise the pH. The problem is these hydroxyl ions do actually go through the electrolyte. <coughs> they marry up with the Fe plus two at the anode and that creates rust, which occurs only at the anode but you need the cathode in order to support that reaction. So our approach, what we try to do, is we try to either eliminate the anode or the cathode, or we try to bring the, the moisture level down and, and limit the availability of oxygen or, or water. And if we can do any one of those four things or a combination of them, then we'll have the same effect on corrosion. And really what Graham's gonna talk about with cathodic protection is how you basically, I guess, uh, eliminate the anode the steel from being the anode, because that's where the corrosion is taking place. And you do that in an artificial manner uh, through cathodic protection. 
And all of this, by the way, is, is natural, right? This is just iron, trying to go back to iron ore, which is what we dug out of the ground and fired kilowatts of energy into to create steel. And then the steel spends the rest of its life trying to go back to iron ore. So it's completely natural. Anything we do to slow it down or stop it is, is really artificial, in a sense. Right? And the problem is when that rust develops, the, the, the amount of uh, expansion could be eight to 10 times greater than the steel itself. So that will induce stress into the concrete. As that stress in, in continues, it will crack. And then eventually, as that continues even further, it will spall. So we see a lot of this chloride-induced corrosion, we call it that, and also carbonation-induced. <coughs> and it's not one or the other. A lot of times they do uh, both exist on the same job, and there is a synergy between the two. You know, we talk about a threshold for chlorides. If it's in carbonated concrete, that threshold could actually go down to zero. You don't need any chlorides if it's carbonated. If the pH is uh, kind of in the middle there, you know, then the, the chlorides, you know, maybe they're, they're a little bit lower as to what would cause uh, a condition for corrosion. Carbonation is a little different. We, we describe this as a front. So up here is our steel that's been cast in the concrete. It looks good. Um, you're up at a, around a 12 or 13 pH. And then the problem is over time, carbon dioxide that's just inherently naturally in our atmosphere will get into the concrete. It reacts with the free lime of the cement and creates a, a product called uh, calcium carbonate, which has a lower pH than the concrete itself. <clears throat> and we literally refer to this as a front. You can see this. I've heard figures where this will penetrate concrete at a rate of one millimeter per year. So that's almost an inch every 25 years. And if you think about the structures that we're talking about today, these structures are 70, 100 years old. So you would expect the carbonation to actually be three to four inches into the concrete on a structure that's 70 to 100 years old. But you also add that uh, it will quicken with moisture. So moisture will carry the, the CO2 through quicker. Yep. And now this, this is not necessarily a problem, but eventually this gets to the steel. And if you think back a few slides, now that that's gotten to the steel, the passive film is no longer it's struggling to stay intact. Oxygen and moisture is, is present, corrosion begins, and then as that corrosion continues, it expands, cracks, and spalls. And that's basically the process in a, in a nutshell. So those two, carbonation and chlorides, those are some of the biggest culprits that we're faced with when it comes to concrete repair. So the repair and protection approach, okay, so now that I've kind of spent a lot of time talking about the, uh, the, the problems, um, when it comes to our, this is kind of a, a SICA philosophy, if you will, but it's you know, but the industry, I, I believe, has a, has a similar uh, approach to this. It's, it's repair and protect. And the repair, you know, what we're really doing here is we're fixing the visible damages. You know, whether it's a spool, a failed joint, a crack, a rough surface, and a lot of times the owner, you know, they kind of understand that those areas need to be addressed. Um, Protection, though, I kind of break that into, I call it a three-pronged approach. There's active mitigation. So what we're trying to do is something on the surface of the steel to actively mitigate that corrosion process. Then there's maybe the application of a coating on the surface of the concrete. And I call that, you know, it's maybe that's more of a passive, but we're, we're trying to prevent ingress of oxygen and moisture into the concrete. So it prevents the steel from existing in an environment that's getting increasingly worse. And then, you know, I think it's always a good idea to monitor the health afterwards. Take a look before, do your repair and protection, and then monitor it going forward to see how it's performing over time. So why do we want to protect? Well, the active, as I indicated, we're doing something on the steel surface. Passive, we're protecting the concrete because we want to really keep all of these things out of the concrete. Now, we want to keep water out. Keep water out and keep chlorides out and salts. Prevent the inf infiltration of sulfates and gases because ultimately all this stuff does lead to the rebar corrosion. So the basic approach that we, we take as an industry is we remove the unsound concrete, expose the, uh, the reinforcing steel, 
we'll get we'll prime the rebar and the substrate. Then we'll do the spool repair, fill and seal all the cracks in the joints. Okay, so up until this point, this is all things I would call repair. Okay. Then we do active corrosion protection. Then we do passive corrosion protection, which is coating and uh, basically affecting the resistivity of the concrete. And then we monitor the overall health. So this for me is always the starting point on any project. The challenge is often, you know, you, you, okay, the owner, yep, 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 yep. Well, uh, I don't know if I have money in the budget for this or for this or for that. You know, that's, that is the reality of it. You know, it's, it's the top five bullet points they realize they probably can't get away with it. Um, and my, my recommendation is always to do the right job, but maybe phase it instead of doing the whole job and doing really half correctly. Do 100% correctly and do the half job and, and try to phase it. But so if you do this, the full the Graham's approach, which is the cathodic protection and everything, is that a 25-year fix, a 50-year fix, or? It says 25 plus, but the anode yeah. basically lasts 100 years. Yeah. So yeah. it's about control. It's about so taking it's control. Longer than us. Yeah. I think the uh, the, the issue uh, is quite interesting is when the, the client uh, just wants to go down to the, the, the seal the cracks and joints, but wants the warranty as if he's done everything else. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. we had yeah. an issue. We worked with the Port of San Francisco on a facade that they had near the cruise ship terminal. Mm -hmm. And like two years ago, they were like, oh, we're opening the cruise ship terminal. We've got these adjacent piers, and we want to just do a quick fix on it. So they did right. the initial stuff, maybe even not in the best, because because it was the port, they sort of didn't have qualified contractors. They brought concrete workers in from San Francisco DPW and sort of fixed it. Mm -hmm. So they kind of patched it up and then painted over it. And so does that harm the building in the long term, or are they just going to have to undo all that? Or and it's no. just they're paying for it twice, or is it, yeah, I, it's I, a timeline. You know, you, you've not got to the root of the control. Yeah. Therefore, all you've done is win a bit of time. Uh, it, how long that is, we know. Yeah. It's down to environment. Yeah. It's down to that I, change. I'm always again. a firm believer. You know, as yeah. I started off with, you know, the jobs that are successful for us, I can almost tell, you know, from day one, because they're doing the inspection, they're identifying the problem. They're coming up with a fix. And before they actually implement it, they do a mock-up. And then they get a good contractor who's, you know, some of this stuff, it, it, you can, it's easy to take for granted, but there's a, a very high level of skill involved to do it correctly. And, you know, it's almost like playing Russian roulette, right? If the owner decides, uh, you know, I'm going to go with the guy who's not trained, not really involved in nice your eye and understands the industry, uh, I mean, there's more to it than meets the eye, you know, to actually do proper concrete repair and protection. So you kind of get what you pay for. And, uh, you know, if I were advising that client, I would tell them to, you know, rather than do it incorrectly now, I would defer it until you could have the money to do yeah. it correctly. Well, to me, there's also a very simple question to ask who is offering you a, a solution. And that is, have you done it before? And can you show me the longevity of what you've done. You know, so if somebody's coming to give you a, a, a fix and, and is saying it's going to last 10 to 15 years, well, is there one there that has done? You know, because yeah, there's plenty of case studies yeah. uh, that are around that, that, that prove that point. There's plenty, plenty of awards being given for longevity. So have you got that case study? What you're telling me, does it work? You know, and if there isn't that proof there, then you know, buyer beware. That's the, Right. So, then. so really today what we're focused is on the red. Again, it's it's really the repair, not so much the protection. That could actually be another another seminar. Okay. So the <coughs> basics for repair, and I'll walk you through a little bit. This is right out of uh, the International Concrete Repair Institute. And there's a couple of guides that are extremely useful to either specify as a requirement uh, or understand. Because this industry is, it's really, it's engineers, it's contractors and material suppliers coming together at a table to really identify, you know, what are the needs of the industry and then what are the right ways uh, to address these needs. And these two guidelines are two of the best, I think. Um, this guideline for selecting and specifying concrete surface prep. So it's how you specify the preparation 
And then this is also how you prepare concrete that is the result of steel that's corroded. And they're, they're great publications. Uh, include them in, in your specifications. Um, and that, that's a great starting point. It's like building a house. You know, if you're going to build a house, you want to put it on a good foundation. To me, surface prep is, is critical. You know, it's, it's one of the main reasons why repairs fail prematurely is because of poor surface prep. So within the surface prep, there's these chips, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, but you're defining the level of preparation based upon what it is you're installing, right? So here if I'm doing uh, kind of a high build coating versus a cementitious polymer repair or overlay, this is the area, this is the zone that I want that surface roughness to be. And then down below are various ways of, uh, of doing concrete preparation um, and then the type of profile that will result from this type of preparation. The way we handle it as a manufacturer is I just tell them what I want. I want a CSP6 for my product. And then I leave all of this up to the contractor, means and methods. I really don't care what or how he achieves a CSP6, as long as when he goes to put my product down, the profile is there, it's clean, there's no contaminants, and then I know I'm gonna have good adhesion. I think sometimes specifiers get hung up with specifying <coughs> how, when they should really be specifying you know, what it is they want. All right. For concrete repair, we're usually in this zone of CSP 5 to 7. And these are the chips, which are great. It comes with the guide. It's a plastic chip. You can actually just put it down on the substrate and determine, you know, is the, is the roughness do I actually have a CSP5 or 6? Because that's what the material supplier says you need to get good adhesion of their repair, repair material. Then you get to how do you do your, your boundary? Um, I've been on jobs where they've done this. They've literally just excavated out exactly what they've defined as being spalled, where really what they ought to do is just try to simplify the shape, you know, as much as practical. Uh, we were actually on a job yesterday where they were going the other extreme and telling them, you know, they were excavating this because that's really what the spool was. And that to me is, that's a good, that's a good geometry. But the engineer was telling them to also take this out and square it up, which there needs to be a little bit of a, you know, a balance <coughs> of, uh, of reasonableness there. When it comes to reinforcing steel, you know, it's, we want to expose the steel, okay? Then we want to excavate out around the steel, and then we also want to chase, we really want to chase the rust and get that to a point where there's no longer rust on the steel. Expose the steel at 360 degrees. You want to be able to get your hand behind that steel, and now you can clean the steel properly, but you also get good adhesion of your repair material, and you get good protection around the steel. And that's really the proper technique to, to do the repair. So it starts with removal. And there's lots of different methods, means and methods to do that. Could be hydroblasting, here they're removing the coating, but there is actually hydroblasting, hydrodemolition, where they're spraying at you know, 20,000 PSI and they're doing concrete removal, which I love. I think that's one of the best methods of, uh, of prep, but there's leads to other challenges in terms of just uh, dealing with waste and removal. And it's also, you know, it's, it can be dangerous if you're not, you need to be highly skilled it's, that it's, equipment. it's noisy as well. It's noisy, and you can sever a limb if you're not careful. So it's not something to leave to the amateurs. And there's companies that specialize in this. But I've seen it done here in the Bay Area almost more than I've seen in other parts of the country. And to me, as a supplier, it's, it's, I love it. Because you don't bruise the concrete. You don't induce cracks. You clean it. And, it's a, it's a, and you get a, a very rough surface for concrete repair. You get beautiful adhesion. So it's a great technique. But now that the steel's been, been uh, exposed, you know, they've got, this is a pretty good job here. They've got, you know, the area's been excavated around. It's been chipped out. This is a full depth repair. So they've actually taken it all the way through the slab and they're forming this. But now they'll, they'll remove all the rust product that's on the steel and get the bar nice and clean. This is actually at Lake Merritt. They were grinding the, uh, the steel here and prepping this before placement of the concrete repair. Okay, so this is an area, the geometry, 
you know, this is, that's not ideal. I mean, I, I'd like to see a saw cut around the perimeter. And again, a reasonably simple geometry. Can you do a little dovetail on the saw cut or just straight? Just straight is, is fine. You don't need to try to cut that in and get, you know, you'll get really good adhesion of the repair material. Ideally, you'd like to actually roughen up the saw cut a little bit. The reality is it doesn't really get done, but you get good adhesion with that anyway. This is, this is okay, not bad. Um, probably could undercut this a little bit better. I don't know that you necessarily need that. You know, but again, I'm splitting hairs here. I mean, this is, this is a good job of, of excavation and removal. Next step being... And you wouldn't go to a uniform depth everywhere? It seems thin no, and thick. No, I don't, I don't believe you have to. And uh, if, if you go back to the, to the guideline, yeah, they'll show a nice uniform depth. And that was actually one of the discussions we had on a job yesterday. And uh, again, it's, it's really that level of reasonableness. Um, I, I think as long as you get the concrete out that's, that's delaminated, and uh, you, know, it, you don't necessarily want it too crazy, because you could induce some stress into the repair material. But in general, I think this is a pretty good job. The reason they're, they're doing this is to actually chip out around the bar. So they're really doing what they're, what they're being told to do. So this is a very nice repair that's been cut out, very simple geometry. You know, even this, I'm fine with this. You know, I don't think you have to take it out to there. But, you know, some consultants may require that. In here, they've, they've actually put some anodes. So again, these, these anodes are intended to protect the steel that's out here, this incipient anode, and try to prevent that from occurring. Spoil at a window, again, just good, good prep there, saw cut around the perimeter, removal and excavation of all the concrete, and then next step here would be to clean the reinforcing steel. So the key properties here, okay, clean the steel, apply the rebar coating. We like to, we encourage this a lot because a lot of times we're doing this because of poor cover. So the excavation has, has occurred. They're priming the steel. They're also applying a, a bonding agent to the, to the substrate. We'll do that this afternoon. And the key properties here would be, you know, excellent adhesion because that's going to really encourage high bond strengths. Corrosion inhibitor in these materials is a good idea because that'll help protect the steel. If it's a barrier to water and chlorides, that's going to extend the life of the structure. A longer over time has more to do with some of the logistics of flexibility. So you can place the material and you can come back the next day and actually we'll, we'll do a form and pour this afternoon. A lot of times they'll coat the steel, put the form on, and then come back in the morning and place the concrete. So you don't have to do it within 20 minutes or half hour. Not a vapor barrier, so it's breathable, which means we can use these materials uh, slab on grade. And then sprayable is, is often useful because you can get some greater productivity. So here's just some examples. This is where it's been coated on the steel. And really what we're doing here is getting what we call effective cover. So we're putting more protection on the steel, which is making up for the deficiency of not having the right amount of cover. And then next we're going to do the scrub coat. So that's, you want to get the material worked into the substrate. Now this, the scrub coat can be either a separate material, it's a bonding agent, or it could actually be the repair material that you take and scrub into the substrate. For me, I, I'm, I don't mind either way. What you're trying to achieve is good intimate contact with the substrate. And then replacement of the small material. So for me, for our repair materials, really the goal there is we're filling the spool, we're restoring integrity. A lot of times these repairs are not structural in my opinion. Uh, it's obviously up to the consultant to determine that. Um, we want it to act monolithically with the existing concrete. We want it to protect the reinforcing steel. And we want it to be durable. So for me, my first 10 years with Seek, I was the product manager for our repair materials and this was really our, our philosophy on, on what the repair material ought to do. Okay, so here's here's an example back to that spool where he's he's coated the steel, he's put the bonding agent on, and he's now beginning to bring this up with a hand patch to get that spool filled, and then doing the final strike off with the trowel to get that fully compacted and finished. So the key properties, whenever we would develop any repair material, we wanted compatibility with improved properties relative to the base concrete. 
So if my base concrete is 5,000 PSI, I don't need a 10,000 PSI repair material. You know, I need something that's four to six, some, somewhere in that range. But I do want it to resist chloride intrusion, so I want it to have low permeability. I want it to resist carbonation. I want it to have a modulus of elasticity that's compatible with the substrate, so the way it reacts to potential loads that are placed on it. I want it to resist the freeze thaw. But the other thing, you know, I need a contractor to be able to install this, right? So if it works in our lab, that's great, but it needs to work on the site. It needs to be easy to mix in place, because if it isn't, then the contractor may do things to facilitate that, which may not necessarily be desirable. But as a manufacturer, it's our job to make it easy to mix in place so that nobody wants to modify it. They like it the way it's, it is, it's packaged. Then we want to achieve excellent bond and minimal shrinkage. These are the two biggest problems in concrete repair. And if we can deal with bond and shrinkage, minimize cracking, that's 80, 90% of the problems. Right, so that's really our main focus. So this was, I believe, uh, Brad, this was out in Alcatraz, right? Correct. So, so they specified material, and then they did some prep and mock-ups down here. And that's, when I see this, I feel very comfortable about the job because I feel like the steps are being taken. <coughs> and here what they do is uh, they're checking the profile of the substrate. We call for a CSP5. So we're checking to make sure that the, the roughness is, is good. But then they did some pull tests and just checked how good is the bond. And we got good adhesion values, but we're also, we're pulling substrate, which is also desirable. You know, if you can pull the parent concrete, that's as strong as you're gonna get. You're not gonna get any stronger than the parent concrete. You don't want to bond adhesion and failure. Even if you get cohesive in the repair mortar, that's okay. But you do want to stress of, you know, 175, 200 PSI. And if you're in that range, with good adhesion, then you know you've got good quality <coughs> repair. So this was interesting. I pulled some of these out from some examples of just repairs to some of the ornate facade elements. And just bear in mind, I mean, this is from a concrete repair perspective, um, but it was, it was kind of interesting to me, and a lot of this was pulled from the Bay Area, projects that, that actually, Brad, you, you worked on. Um, so this was 975 Green Street. <coughs> So they've excavated out to expose the concrete and the steel, but now they've got to basically try to match the existing uh, concrete that's in place. On this job, they actually took these headers, they found some on, on site that were intact, took them back to their shop, and they cast, they precasted uh, headers in their shop using our material, brought the sections back out to site, and then installed them to basically match what was in place uh, with a new material to try to be sensitive to the original fabric of the building. And those must have like a stainless steel dowel or something that's holding them in. Uh, they, they used mortars. Uh, some of that would be, yeah, you'll see some dowling that was done and actually uh, epoxied in. Um, some of it was mortared into place. Um, not sure exactly how all the fastening did occur on this, on this particular job. Uh, but here, the bottom of these details, this is, this is a new precast element that was cast to, to match the existing. So for me, it was kind of interesting putting this together just to see what can be accomplished on site. One thing, again, it's, it's repairing the, the concrete and protecting the steel. The other is, is being sensitive to you know, the original fabric of the, you know, of the building. And I know, like, John, you showed me some of your trowels and tools that you've worked with in the field to, to try to match those elements as, as best and reasonable as possible. So here's an example, yeah, this, this feature here, a lot of those uh, had, had uh, problems with either free thaw or, or other damages, and they were able to cast these off-site, and then they dowled them into place using an epoxy, and they had a very, uh, nice. a very innovative method, <laughs> very innovative method for keeping them in place while the epoxy cured. If you had women, you could have used brassiers. Or something. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go with. Uh, there's a whole host of options. Not really depends on the spacing. <laughs> <laughs> and they did end up coating this when it was all said and done. In this case here, they actually used some repair mortar to try to repair some of these features. I know John, you're sharing with me some of your history there of trying to match some of these elements and you know it's 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 art as much as yeah. it is uh, uh, actually concrete repair work yeah. right 
and even some of these uh, features were taken off, cast back at the yard, and then uh, reinstalled on site. So in here they have like a, a bed of mortar. I'm not sure if they did anything else in terms of securing that in. I don't know, Brad, do you know on that job how that was ultimately fastened? The pins. Yeah. They used some pins? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then actually we were actually at by this yesterday. So this was this was 945 uh, Green Street. So for me it was kind of neat to be able to pull some of this together, not just with projects all over the country, but actually projects here in, in San Francisco. And it was, it was interesting for me because a lot of this, I don't know if uh, this extent of this kind of work has been done, like even in New York, for example. You know, a lot of what the repair in New York is, is uh, buildings that were built in the 70s, 60s, and they're repairing a lot of balconies, as opposed to some of these ornate uh, repairs. So here's that Point Arena lighthouse. Again, you see the steel. This was marked off in a previous photo with just how much rust uh, loss of section there. This has been reinstated now with concrete and then and then coated. I believe this is the uh, Biltmore Hotel in uh, in uh, Palm Beach, applying a coating. So then, last, you know, a lot of times, in the, a lot of times, these buildings are getting coated. Uh, we'll always recommend a protective coating, not a paint. And for us, the differences there would be that you know they're elastomeric, so there's some flexibility. There's ability to bridge cracks. Uh, they're breathable, so they do allow moisture to pass in the form of vapor, but it will keep it'll keep water out, keep water from getting into the concrete. So they are waterproofed. They have low dirt pickup, so they even though they're flexible, they're not sticky, so they don't pick up dirt. These should be all the characteristics if if a coating is specified for concrete. Aesthetically pleasing, that's certainly got to be a consideration and anti-carbonation. So these coatings are designed to keep CO2 out of the concrete to prevent the carbonation process from, uh, from proceeding. And that's an example of a uh, phenothalene test that was done on site. So again, the concept here, this is 1101 Green Street. You can see that, that some of the repairs being done, the extent of what that looked like after the coating was, uh, was removed, and this is what it looks like today, you know, some eight years, eight years later. So with that, I think I got time for, for maybe one case study. Um, I'm going to go through it a little, you know, somewhat quick, but hopefully it ties together some of the things here that we've, we've talked about. So 222 Sutter Street. So this is a project right here in uh, downtown San Francisco, uh, built in 1904. Um, as far as we know, it's not a registered landmark. It's a 10-story building. It's a steel frame, and it's got a very ornate uh, terracotta front. But the other side, the rear and the sides, are reinforced concrete. So the side's not seen from the building elevation. And this is a, a, a rendering from the early 1900s, and, and that's the building right there. So here, the owner, their original objectives here were to do some concrete repair, but they really, the main scope entailed doing a, an abatement of the existing <coughs> lead coating to get that removed. They also were going to repaint the building and then uh, replace the window glazing. The problem was during the abatement, though, they actually uncovered a lot of areas of poor quality concrete. And through the abatement process, actually began to expose some of the reinforcing steel because the concrete was kind of punky, as we, as we term it, um, but relatively poor quality cover. Uh, there was failed sealants, and there was also evidence of, uh, of corrosion. So this isn't necessarily what it looked like after the abatement, but this is, you know, you, you did have areas here where the the steel was exposed, and so now they went to the extra step now of just doing more of a proper surface prep, exposing the steel where it was appropriate, and uh, and doing the parging and patching of that of those areas. So that was the original scope and and the goals, but after the original abatement, it really quickly grew to a scope that was beyond the original, which was to repair the building. It was it was fully occupied tenants. It was a commercial office space. Uh, wanted to make it look as it did before, minimize disruptions to the tenant, and budget was a major concern of the, uh, of the owner. So this is after doing some of the initial survey work and the beginning of some of the concrete removal and demolition. So you can see just to the, the extent of, they, they ended up on scaffolds doing 100% uh, 
sounding of the uh, of the facade to identify the concrete that was spoiled or loose. And a lot of areas were just, wow. you know, it was very easy to break through the existing concrete. Uh, you can see here the, the bar from the old days where it's the actual, you know, it's square reinforcing steel. Very sophisticated uh, method of inspection <laughs> techniques. <laughs> and uh, this was actually an Alcatraz. Now, this is actually still 222 <laughs> Summer Street. But, uh, I guess this is what you do in, uh, maybe during your breaks, right? You know, I'm talking about it on the break. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's the extent of the removal of concrete. Um, as a result of that original you know, abatement and then taking it now another step to just remove all the poor quality concrete. So here you begin to see just the magnitude of, of how much steel is exposed. This is that, uh, I believe it's a water tower up on the, the top floor there. Yeah. Um, that is just, you see the, the, the mat of steel all exposed. <clears throat> Concrete preparation, so now getting areas kind of roughed out, saw cut, removal and excavation, and exposure of the steel. Um, on this job, they used the rebar coating. There was about 4,000 square feet of concrete repair, and they did this in two methods, form and pour, and hand applied. Uh, there was corrosion protection um, in the form of a rebar coating. Sealants were also used. And then the last step in the process was about 30,000 square feet of an anti-carbonation coating. So the, pro the project actually started in September of 2006, but again, during that abatement process, the problem was identified, and they got into some of the heavy demolition work in, uh, in November of 2006, and it was about two years to complete the, uh, complete the project. So here's some concrete repair work. So some of the areas with the deeper spalls or spalls that went all the way through the wall form and pour it into place. And then other areas were parge coated. And what I really like about this picture here is the, the curing that, uh, that Western's doing on this job, which to me, when I go out and I see this on a project, you know, it tells me that the contractor's paying attention to detail. You know, curing on a vertical surface is not easy. But it doesn't mean you don't do it because it's not easy. What about um, this way of curing versus they contractors always want to just submit a product that they spray on it? Um, I, you know, you, you can go with the product that you spray on it, but in this case, they're going to apply a coating. And that was our concern uh, in this case is that it, does it doesn't become a contaminant for the surface to so, go to. Right. So then you got to remove oh. that yeah, yeah, yeah. in order to do it. So, you know, you got to pay attention to detail. And I, I, I'm just, I'm always so impressed when I see something like this. When the contractor's curing on a vertical surface, you know, you got a good contractor and they're doing it right. Here they rebuilt the, uh, the cornice areas, so form and pour of that material. So you had this, this is what it looked like during demolition and, and prep. This is after form and pour and uh, parging. And then the last step was applying a coating. So not necessarily you know, a tremendously ornate building, but we're kind of repairing the back sides of the building. And um, it looks like there was attention paid to match the board forming in the surface. Yeah, it was, uh, that was one of our, our bigger challenges, for sure. Yeah, yeah so some sensitivity to that, you know, the, the original look and, and fabric of the, uh, of the building. So you have something that was like this during investigation, identifying the extent of the problems to something that's like this. And this is now, I think, eight years, eight years old. Yeah. Right? So again, just a good example of following good concrete repair practice. And this is eight years old and, and no sign of any problems. And uh, if the owner pays attention to this, maybe in a few years, they'll power wash it, take a look at how see the coating's performing, and maybe apply another coat. You know, that might be the, the extent of the maintenance. Um, I don't have time to go through this, but I'm, I'm just going to go. Tim, if you if, if you want to, uh, the, the the next stage is not a full hour. You know, I don't I don't need that for the first part of it. So I mean, if you wanted to do it, you're welcome to. Um, yeah, I think I would probably need about 15 minutes. Is that? Yeah, I'll, I'll do mine in about 30. Okay. All right. So and then uh, the next one's a longer one. Okay. So let's. Uh so John, how'd you do in the budget on that last one? <coughs> Seems like a huge. Scope change. There was a lot of negotiation. Um, it, it was a huge scope change, and that, that actually delayed the project uh, 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 quite a bit. Yeah. You know, um, we did well. Um, it became a partnership 
you know, and we had to uh, really, we ended up opening our books and, and really uh, share costs and, and, and share where we were with it to, to develop a level of comfort to get beyond from a $300,000 job to a $2.8 million job. You know, uh, it, it took some work. Yeah, and unfortunately, when you're dealing with this, you know, in, until it's almost like doing excavation in a new construction job. It's it's not until you, you know, there's a lot of unknowns out there until you actually sound it, and then even excavate mm -hmm. it. You know, then then you've kind of defined most of the unknowns. I mean, there's still potential unknowns down the road, but that's probably the biggest risk. You know, you, but again, you, you'll see on this job here a, a, a different approach. Um, you know, where on that job it was originally an abatement job. They ran into scope that was not anticipated, and now it was how do we do this fix? Do it correctly, um, and also try to you know have some semblance of you know what the budget is and be sensitive to that. Um, so I mentioned this job. This was it also goes by the name of Bel Air Tower. This is 1101 Green Street, and Brad and I worked on this job. We submitted it to ICRI in 2008, and it won an award of excellence for high rise. Um, so it's a, it's a real nice project. Um, I'm calling this downtown San Francisco. I, mean, I don't know if that fair uh, <laughs> description of it. If I'm a guy from out of town, uh, but anyway, built in nice tender knob. I think is the uh, tender knob. Tender knob. That's Russian. Like Russian Hill. Yeah. Yeah. You're above, it's, the, you're above the tunnel. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is pretty cool. I mean, this is like seems like right yeah. at the the peak because yeah. uh, it seems like you go down. Mm. You know, in in any direction you're going down. Um, the owner is the Bel Air Homeowners Association. It was one of the first uh, high-rises built after the 1906 earthquakes, and my understanding <laughs> was it was built to new seismic codes, and it was one of the first residential high-rises. Um, it's an Art Deco form of, uh, of architecture, 20 stories, has a steel frame, and this is really the point of interest for, for us. It was slabs and walls that were reinforced concrete, they had about 640 windows, 80,000 square feet. So this is a very large project for us. Um, and there it is, really more toward the end of the construction stage. And this is some of the views from, from the upper floors. So pretty uh, high rent district, as I understand it. Um, and some pretty important people in San Francisco either lived or, or live in this, in this building. Uh, so the problems. It had a long history of, of poor maintenance, uh, a lot of leakage around the windows, sort of haphazard window replacement where some of the tenants replaced their windows with you know aluminum windows and there was really no sort of uh, cohesive approach to it. It was just sort of each tenant more or less decided how they were going to deal with that issue. There was a lot of coats of coating on the building that you know, the other balance now is even if you're using a breathable coating, if you keep applying coat after coat, at some point that coating may become unbreathable, which means you could lock moisture in, uh, which is really not, not a good thing in terms of just the, the, the steel environment, but also could cause premature failure of the coating. So there is that, that balance. You probably get away, it's almost like re-roofing your house. I mean, at least in New Jersey where I'm from, you can do one sort of... Uh, you have an existing roof, you can put one layer of new roof on top. But the next time you go to a roof, you got to strip it all back and, and have one layer. Uh, so they had concrete spalling. In this case, what the, the approach that they took, though, is they did a very large mock-up. They picked like four floors on the western elevation, 4,500 square feet. They did a 100% inspection of the area, came up with this drawing to identify the, the spalls. And this is just during the mock-up phase. You know, so they removed the coating, did all the sounding, and then the repair that they did, well, a lot of the spools were around the windows. They had the steel frames that were corroding. Um, but they also had a lot of spalling within the concrete itself. So it was just this normal uh, reinforcing steel corrosion. Failure at joints, a lot of cracks, as you saw in some of those previous photos. And a lot of spools that had been previously fixed had actually failed. Now, some of them were 20 years old, um, so they got good life out of the, out of the spools. It's not to say that all those spools were problematic, um, but they were also dealing with that. And this was actually the, how it looked at the completion of the mock-up. So the thing I love about that, you know, I worked with Turner Construction before joining SICA, and we kind of lived and died by the mock-up. You know, it's one thing to know what it looks like on a 
plan and set of drawings. It's another for the contractor to actually go execute it and then to see what it looks like. Um, so this was this was a neat approach for me. So it's a big mock-up too, bigger than I would yeah. expect. Yeah, and that, that was unusual for, for me. I kind of picked up on that, and that's why I highlighted it as part of the scope of this job. For whatever reason, the consultant wanted to do several floors and get a good square footage area. But you're right, that's a much larger mock-up than, uh, than normal. Hey, Andrew, usually, it, it, usually a, a mock-up might have been, you know, you yeah, kind of do yeah, this no, area yeah. here. It, it is a big building, though, and if you stand back from that and you want to see the full impact of, of the change, yeah, yeah. Then it's, it's, it's actually quite it's helpful. 5%. I, yeah. I would guess that it also represents uh, a, a better representation of all the different challenges that exactly. you think they're going to face. Mm, yeah. And that, that's what they're after. So it's the size should really try to capture as many of the details that you're after. And uh, he, So what they did was they, they were going to route and seal all the moving cracks with a urethane sealant, <clears throat> coat the reinforcing steel with, uh, with a, an epoxy cement coating. You'll see that out in back in the, uh, this afternoon. Uh, they had form and pour and hand applied repair materials where they were going to use polymer modified cement repair materials. They were going to use galvanic anodes around the windows. In some areas they were going to remove and replace the windows power wash, and then do a coating. And that was the sequence that was defined. They implemented that in the mock-up, and they were happy with the results, so they ended up using that scope to define the, uh, the scope of the project. They did adjust some of the scope at the windows, and I'll be honest, to this day, I'm not 100% clear on exactly what they did. Um, but the west and the south wall, as I understand it, originally they were going to remove and replace the windows. There were some fire code issues because of adjacent buildings and how close they were to the building. So they modified that scope to just really remove sashes and reglaze, re uh, but they left the steel frames in place, uh, which removal of the steel frames would have been a lot of work, uh, but I think they were also concerned about some of the code issues of once you got into that, you might have had to do other things. Um, the existing aluminum windows were left in place, but the perimeters were all sealed. Again, the steel flanges, they were going to then be protected. They were originally anticipating removing a lot of those. Because they left them in place, they used galvanic anodes to protect them. Um, and here, you know, we don't see this on every job, but they did a full survey of the exterior building. 100% got their hands on 100% of the area. And when they bid the job, the, co the consultant had a very good set of elevations of where they anticipated spalls that could then go out and be bid uh, by, I believe in this case it was five uh, contractors who were part of both ICRI and SWRI. Um, so two very well respected, I haven't mentioned SWRI, but that's the Sealant Waterproofing Restoration uh, Institute. So they have quantities by repair type? Yeah, they did, they did identify, <laughs> you know, around the windows they tended to be deeper spools, and I think they labeled them as type A. Within the walls, they weren't quite as deep, and those were type B. So type A may have been three inches deep, type A was an inch and a half deep. But they had an idea of the quantities involved as well. And to my mind, it's the more investigation you do up front, the better you define the scope. Um, you can actually then go out and, and get bids and, and hopefully minimize you know, the potential for, you know, unforeseen conditions on the job. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, pay me now or pay me later type of, type of thing. Um, they did the job in four years, four phases. They had to avoid doing any work during the winter. And the sequence was basically, you know, install the scaffolding, swing stage, interior protection, remove and abate the wall coating. After the wall coating was done, then the consultant went back up and actually reinvestigated and did all the sounding again. Um, concrete demolition, installation of the anodes, spall and crack repair. And again, here's removal of the coating. In some cases, this took maybe two or three drops to get the coating fully removed. Because again, they had like 90 mils of this built up. You saw this photo earlier, but some of the prep work, grinding of the steel around the windows. A huge part of the scope of this work was the window refurbishment, almost as much as the concrete repair. And here they were grinding the sashes, removing the glass, installing new flashings at the sills, repainting, new glazing, new glass, bead of silicone sealant, new handles, perimeter seals. So all of this stuff taking place around the uh, 
around the windows. But you know, after the repairs were done, though, the consultant would go back up there to use like a Schmidt hammer to test for uh, uh, compaction and quality. And then, and then after that was done, they applied the coating. So really, the, the quality control was very good. The consultant was very active on the job and really doing inspections along the way. But you know, here you get an idea of some of the extent though, of some of the spalling that was, you know, they had to deal with on the, uh, on the facade. And then you also had, in some cases, these fairly ornate um, details that were part of that building as well. And then a project summary, so they approached each elevation, you know, year by year, starting in 08, finishing in, in uh, 2010. They averaged about 30 men a day, almost split 50-50 between crews working on windows versus doing concrete repair. So it was a you know, very large <coughs> window uh, repair and replacement project as much as it was a concrete repair project. But some of the quantities, 3,500 anodes, 1,500 linear feet of concrete repair, 2,000 you know, square feet. Keep in mind, on Sutter Street, it was 4,000 square feet. So it was a much smaller job but twice the square footage of, uh, of Swalling. Uh, this was 80,000 square feet, and then 80,000 square feet of a wall coating. But that's pretty typical. I'd say a lot of times when we're doing concrete repair, it's five to 10% of the surface area. That's kind of the rough average. On Sutter, it happened to be a, a much higher percentage than that. So here's the before and then the after. Um, so just a great, I like this job for as much as the scope that was done, as much as the way it was also managed, and uh, the consultant, you know, developing of the details, the mock-ups, inspection on site during the installation, you know, all those things are what led to, you know, completion of a very successful job. Um, so as I mentioned, I could mention this, but I, you know, it's an obvious statement. I mean, historic buildings. I mean, they're they're an important feature of many of our of our cities. Uh, I mean, I, I love visiting these projects uh, when we get the opportunity and just how beautiful and ornate they are. I mean, they're spectacular. But, you know, due to their age, they are inherently at risk or in need of repair. You know, I think these buildings, Graham, this time frame you're talking about is kind of buildings built from late 1800s to about 1950. So, you know, by, by default, these buildings are 60, 70 to 100, 110 years old. Uh, so they've performed beautifully, but it's like anything else you own. I mean, it, it needs to be maintained, um, and so inherently these buildings are at risk. Many problems are the result of some of the construction methods that were employed. Um, as much in my presentation, but especially in Graham's, you know, you think about the way that construction methods were uh, utilized in that time frame that I mentioned. Uh, you know, where they would build the masonry tight to the steel, and there was no gap. And that's in part what's creating some of these problems that Graham has a very good solution for. But again, the, the assessment is important. Uh, and then it's really important to understand the key properties, get good contractors involved. Um, so for me, the steps are pretty straightforward and simple. Um, the challenge a lot of times, though, is the owner and the budget that they have. And a lot of times those are competing uh, interests. right? Um, but really, to get long-lasting repairs, the options should be implemented, you know, protection options. Not just fix it, fix the known deficiencies, but actually try to protect <coughs> the, the building as well. Okay, so that concludes my portion. Um, I had a couple of questions during the presentation, but you know, we're, we're going to switch questions over. questions while we switch over. Um, so any, anything that I covered that was not clear or... Uh, Need some clarification on that last one with all the, the 90 mils of coating. How did that paint get removed? They they actually used uh, I would say high pressure power wash, where they would have to dial the end the pressure as well as the nozzle configuration to. And then they have to capture that water, obviously. Yeah, yeah. There's always that water retention that you have to uh, be concerned with, and, just, and it did take them. In a lot of cases, several drops because uh, there's just so much of that coating. But uh, you know, I think as you kind of get into that with the, you know, with the with the uh, power wash, you can begin to almost unzip it a little bit. Yeah. But it took some work. You know, as I mentioned, like two or three drops, a little more than what was originally anticipated. But they had some idea of that when they did the mock-up. 
You mentioned on that one you used a polymer modified repair patch or mortar. Yes. Why did you go with that option? Well, it was really the, the, the specifier that would have specified it, but mm -hmm. we, we have that option as, right. as part of our, um, our repair products. Mm -hmm. You know, with the polymer modification, the way we would position our products is if they're polymer modified cement, they tend to be the better products because mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have lower permeability and you'll get very good adhesion right. with those kinds of materials. Um, and on this job, the, the owner, uh, the, the consultant felt that, you know, given some of the other challenges on the job, they wanted to just minimize any risk of bond issues and things like that, so they specified a material like that. And you said it wasn't a landmark building? I don't believe it was. Okay. I can't find anything in, in my write-up or paperwork where it was actually a landmark building. Mm -hmm. It was so obviously a very ornate building, sure, um, but not necessarily a landmark, I guess. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll do some of the hands-on uh, later today.